Here we are again, the third and final video in our first series looking at the signs of phthalates and how they affect our risk of developing diabetes. In the previous two videos, we went from an overview looking at the problem in the human population to the second video getting into some real nitty gritty details answering if and how phthalates are to blame for the elevated diabetes risk with which we're concerned. In this video, I'd like to do two things. So one, you can expect a mechanism for all the issues that we discussed in the previous video, as well as a solution to why vitamins seem to help. So if you're confused, I can only recommend that you step back one video and get tuned in, then come back. Secondly, I'd like to offer you some real world solutions. Uh, I also promise to stop teasing you to go into another video at the end. Sound good? Okay, so at the end of the last video, I showed you some data from the studies that we looked into that illustrated that vitamins could provide some relief from the negative effects that we discussed that emanate from phthalate exposure. So we have to ask ourselves, what functions do vitamins have in our body? Well, beyond being necessary cofactors for a host of different reactions within our cells, they also act as antioxidants as scavengers of oxidative stress. So if we look at just two more pieces of data from one of the aforementioned studies, we can see that the researchers looked into this possibility. In the same image, we're looking at a dye that penetrates the cells and fluoresces green when the dye molecules interact with reactive oxygen species, ROS molecules, which are unstable molecules causing oxidative stress. On the left, we see our phthalates unexposed cells, so in fat and liver cells, no green fluorescence. In the other conditions, we're looking at the cells exposed to one or 10 milligrams per kilogram of phthalates. And lo and behold, bright green fluorescence, indicating significant interaction of the dye molecules with ROS molecules. This all signifies the cells experience some serious oxidative stress when exposed to phthalates. Then if we switch to the other study, we see the same results. With increasing levels of phthalate exposure, there is an increased oxidative stress. And we also see quite clearly that the vitamin supplement helped reduce the oxidative stress considerably, likely acting as an antioxidant. And yet, I wasn't that over the moon about the vitamin data. So why is that? Because of the doses used. They used really high doses, using 100 milligrams per kilogram of weight of vitamin C and 50 milligrams per kilogram of vitamin E. So if you weigh 80 kilograms, that's eight grams of vitamin C and four grams of vitamin E. The recommendations are about a quarter of that for vitamin C at the upper limit, way less for a regular daily dose. And vitamin E is astronomical with a daily intake recommendation about 200 times lower than that administered here. So vitamin C may be well enough tolerated at high doses, but vitamin E can cause some serious health issues. So these doses are ridiculous. That said, does that mean that the vitamins are useless? No, and I can even make an argument for their use by pitting dose against dose. Hear me out. While the vitamin doses administered are ridiculous, so are the phthalate exposures. 100 milligrams per kilogram equates to eight grams of phthalates a day for an 80 kilogram person. You are literally absorbing eight grams of this chemical. That seems extremely far-fetched, especially for another reason that I'll mention later. That said, even 10 milligrams is high, but there was also one study that showed an effect at one milligram. Okay, so whatever the concentration, there's going to be detrimental effects, got it. But since they paired the ridiculous vitamin concentrations with the ridiculous phthalate concentrations, if we scale that down, we might see a protective effect at, of lower, hopefully safe vitamin consumption to combat the lower, more realistic phthalate exposures. That's educated speculation on my part. Hear me now, I do not recommend mass vitamin consumption. That's a different disaster waiting to happen. So what to do? We know all this information. How do we lower our phthalate exposure? First, 
Keep eating a nutrition high in vitamins. That's step one. Clearly the vitamins help. We just don't need to be consuming enough to turn our pee neon yellow as our kidneys hurl insults at us. Second, phthalates are absolutely everywhere, unfortunately. I'll link a source where it lists all the different environmental exposures, but here are a few. Plastics, cosmetics, medications, home products, tubing, food packaging, and many other places. Since it's used as a mixer and used to harden plastics, it's absolutely everywhere. Does that mean that you should stop taking your diabetes medication or stop taking your allergy medication because it might contain phthalates? No, do not do that. But if you can microwave your food less often, you'll reduce the leaching of phthalates from the plastics into your food or eat less processed foods. There's a good start. Stop leaving your plastic bottles of drink in the car during summer. Look for sunscreens and lotions and hair products that are phthalate free. Switch to metal, and I don't mean heavy metal, although I do enjoy some Machine Head and Iron Maiden. I mean avoid plastic bottles. Uh, those are a few ideas, but if you have others, please post them so others can get some other ideas. Now, one other piece of good news. Phthalates do not stay in your body long, only a few hours. So if you make the requisite changes like those I mentioned or the ones that other people might recommend, you could theoretically check your blood or urine levels in a day or two and see a difference. Now we've covered a ton of information over the past several videos and although I'd love to proclaim that we have an undeniable proof phthalates have all these effects, keep in mind that the research is still limited between human research being correlational and the intervention studies being in animals. But if you were to ask me, until we have a group of people willing to expose themselves to high levels of phthalates for science, I think it's pretty safe to say phthalates are increasing your risk of diabetes, even if it may only be a small contributor to the total story of the diabetes problem. Who knows? Hopefully you found this helpful for you, and if you'd like to dive into more, I'd recommend that you stick around so that we can learn together further. Until then, bye.